and uh, the topic that i'm going to discuss today is uh, how to approach cortical visual loss so this will be the outline we'll first uh, recapitulate some important anatomical aspects uh, which are in relation to this topic followed by the cortical visual disorders that is the more clinical aspect disorders related to the striated cortex the extra striated cortex followed by a summary of this presentation so we start with the anatomy so we all know that uh, the visual cortex uh, is part of our occipital lobe and the occipital lobe is the smallest lobe of all the four lobes of the cerebral hemisphere so if we look at these cartoons we look at the cartoon on the left side the occipital lobe is separated from the parietal and temporal lobe anteriorly by this imaginary vertical line this imaginary vertical line runs from the pre occipital notch below and goes up to the parieto occipital sulcus superior the parieto occipital sulcus mostly lies on the medial surface which i'm going to show on in the next slide so behind uh, posteriorly the occipital lobe is bounded by the occipital bone inferiorly it rests on the tentorium cerebelli medially it is limited by the medial longitudinal fissure and the same thing can be appreciated in this gross specimen where we have the pre occipital notch superiorly the parieto occipital sulcus so uh, on the medial surface there are some important sulci which uh, uh, which help in delineation of the important gyri of the occipital lobe this is the parieto occipital sulcus this is the calcarine sulcus this is the collateral sulcus and below the collateral sulcus is the lateral temporo occipital sulcus so between the parieto occipital sulcus and the calcarine sulcus we have an important gyrus which is the most well delineated gyrus of the occipital lobe this is the cuneus on the lips or the banks of the calcarine sulcus and the depth of the calcarine sulcus we have our primary visual cortex between the calcarine sulcus and the collateral sulcus we have the lingual gyrus and this lingual gyrus anteriorly continues into the parahippocampal gyrus between the collateral sulcus and the lateral temporo occipital sulcus we have the fusiform gyrus wherein as we'll see in the subsequent slides we have important areas for word form recognition and face recognition so the same thing can be seen on the gross specimen on the right side this is the most well delineated gyrus or the cuneus the parieto occipital sulcus the calcarine sulcus and on the banks of the calcarine sulcus and the depth of the calcarine fissure we have our primary visual cortex then this is the lingual gyrus continuing into the parahippocampal gyrus and below this we have the fusiform gyrus so the fusiform gyrus is actually more towards the inferior part of the occipital temp occipital temporal junction so functionally we know that the visual cortex is of two types the primary visual cortex and the secondary visual cortex or the association visual cortex so if we correlate it with the broadman visual areas so the area number 17 corresponds to the primary visual cortex or the striated cortex this area is also given another terminology known as v1 area 18 is known as the peristriated cortex and this corresponds to area v2 v3 area number 19 is known as the parastriated cortex and this corresponds to areas v4 v5 so this terminology will be important as we will subsequently see the important uh, functional areas which are located in these cortices and how different lesions can produce specific clinical deficits so we know that the visual inputs they arrive at the primary visual cortex they uh, relay in the lateral geniculate nucleus and via the optic radiations they reach the primary visual cortex which is area v1 here even on a naked eye inspection of the gross specimen we can see this abundantly myelinated uh, optic radiations uh, synapsing at the cortical layer 4 and this is known as the striae of jenneri so it is this distinctive feature which gives the primary visual cortex its other names the striate cortex or the striped cortex or the calcarine cortex or the chalky cortex due to that kind of look so uh, as i said if we trace these occipital radiations backwards so the occipital lobe one occipital lobe is receiving projections from the ipsilateral temporal retina and the contralateral nasal retina so simply it is the two halves of the retina which are on the same side as the occipital lobe and this part of the retina is subserving the 
contralateral visual field. So how is the retina represented in the occipital lobe? So the macular retina uh, is represented at the posterior pole, as we can see here. And the peripheral retina is situated more anteriorly towards the deeper part of the calcarine sulcus. So 50 to 60 percent of the occipital cortex is just subserving the macular retina or the retina which is responsible for 10 to 15 degrees of the central vision. Furthermore, as I said, there are two lips of the calcarine cortex. The superior lip receives projections from the superior retina and the inferior lip receives projections from the inferior retina. So the superior retina is subserving the inferior part of the visual field. So if there is a lesion which is limited to one of the lips of the calcarine sulcus, so that will produce a defect which will respect the horizontal meridian resulting in a quadrantinophia. Example, if there is a left superior occipital lip lesion, that will produce a right inferior quadrantinophia. So this uh, cartoon is uh, very important and I'll spend a minute on this slide because this uh, delineates all the important areas and how these areas take up specialized functions. So as I said, the visual input first reaches V1. From V1, the, in V1 there is some initial processing that is judging of the basic position of the visual stimulus and the orientation of the borders. After this, the visual stimulus will diverge into two pathways. One is the dorsal stream or the wear pathway, which tells you about the visual spatial information of the object, where the object is located. The other pathway is the ventral stream, which tells you about the what the object is. It tells you about the object identity. So let us see the ventral stream first. So after the initial processing in V1, information will go to V2 ventral. In V2 ventral, there is a first discrimination of the colors and the depth of the object. So the first perception of colors occurs in V2. The information then passes to V3 followed by V4. So V4 is the area where the cortex starts discriminating between colors because the neurons here respond to specific wavelengths of light. And V4 also helps in recognition of different geometric shapes. From V4, the information goes to the inferior occipitotemporal region or the fusiform gyrus. In the fusiform gyrus, we have two important areas, the fusiform face area and the visual word form area. So fusiform face area is for encodes information for recognition of specific facial features which help in facial recognition and the visual word form area helps in reading. So the other pathway is the dorsal stream or the wear pathway. So from V1, the information will go to V2 dorsal, V3 dorsal, and then to this mesial temporal visual area, also known as V5. This mesial visual temporal area is important for perceiving motion of objects. Information also goes to V6 or the dorsomedial area, which is actually situated medially. This is important for self-motion. So whenever we have to try to reach an object, it will guide your uh, the motion, your self-motion or targeted motion towards visual stimuli. And the final processing occurs in the posterior parietal cortex. So if we have to see this again, from area 17, we judge the borders and the orientation. V2, V3 in the in the what pathway? V2, V3, first perception of color and depth, V4, color discrimination and geometric shapes, the fusiform area, recognition of faces and visual form of words. <clears throat> in the wear pathway, V1 to V2, V3 dorsal, goes to the mesial temporal or V5 area for motion of objects, also goes to the V6 or dorsomedial area for self-guided motion and finally to the posterior parietal cortex. So this important, <clears throat> work is also sum, uh, summarized in this table. I will not repeat it. And then uh, we have uh, the area which is shaded in yellow is our area of interest today. And we know that it is uh, supplied by branches of the posterior cerebral artery. But the occipital pole or the area where the macula is represented has anastomotic branches from MCA also. So it has a dual blood supply. So we now go on to the cortical visual disorders related to the striate cortex. 
So we take case number one. This is a, a simple case which we see quite often. A patient who has some cardiac risk factors comes with a history of sudden onset difficulty navigating, navigating and is bumping on his right side. So on examination is elementary aspects, visual acuity, pupils, fundus, all are normal. And if we do confrontation, we find a right homonymous hemianopia. So if you just look at the terminologies, hemianopia is a visual field effect which affects half of the visual field. Quadrantinopia affects one fourth of the visual field. Hemianopia may be vertical, may be horizontal. When it's horizontal, we use the term altitudinal. If the field effects are bilateral, then we use the term homonymous if they are similarly located in both the visual fields. That is, if they affect the right side of visual field of both eyes, we'll say it is a homonymous defect. And the term congruous means a point to point correspondence of the defect in either field. So we go back to the case and we see that as we expected, this patient has a left occipital infarct. Another patient says that the vision in the left eye is fuzzy, not able to uh, delineate the uh, problem further. So this patient, who's a known case of malignancy, has come with some recent fuzziness in vision. And again, we did the visual acuity fundus, that is normal. On confrontation testing, we didn't find much, but on visual fields, there is a left superior quadrantinopia. So what do we expect? If there is a superior quadrantinopia, that means the inferior part of the, ox, uh, the, the inferior lip of the calcarine cortex should be involved. So that is what we see in this MRI. This is the calcarine sulcus, the superior bank, the inferior bank, and there is a lesion in the inferior lip of the right calcarine sulcus. So, so to say that so the striate cortex lesions usually present with isolated visual symptoms. And the norm is to have congruous, homonymous, hemianopic or quadrantinopic field loss. But this may not always be true. In cases of unilateral posterior cerebral artery strokes involving the striate cortex, actually sometimes the patient may miss, uh, uh, miss a stroke because uh, since the macula receives a dual supply, the central vision may be spared. Also, sometimes the deepest part or the peripheral part which is subserving this peripheral most part of the temporal field of the contralateral eye, this also gets spared. So there is a sparing of the central vision, there is a sparing of the temporal crescent. So that is why these patients may not have any central vision or navigation problems and may actually miss the deficit. The superior quadrant defects also may not be noticed because this part of the visual field is less often used for our day-to-day -day routine activities. Here, I would also like to say that if a lesion involves only the deepest part of this occipital lobe, which is subserving this peripheral most part of vision, it may lead to a monoocular vision loss in the contralateral eye. This monoocular vision loss in the contralateral eye will involve only this temporal crescent because since the temporal field is larger than the nasal field, there is no corresponding nasal representation. So, Another interesting phenomenon which happens in striate cortex lesions is the Riddock phenomenon. So in the Riddock phenomenon, there is a dissociation of perception between kinetic stimuli and static stimuli. So in a dense field defect, wherein the person is not able to perceive a static stimulus, the same person can appreciate fast moving objects in that field defect. Why so? Because your area V5 or MT, which is important for judging the motion of the objects is preserved. So this area, uh, it is postulated that some islands of spared vision in V1, which are still able to judge some coarse motion, may you know pass on the information to this area leading to perception of motion. Other people also say that this may be due to direct subcortical connections by passing the V1, direct connections from the lateral geniculate nucleus to V5 through the pulvinar superior collicular pathway by passing V1. So these are the postulates and it has a historical aspect to it. It was first described by George Riddock in soldiers, British soldiers um, during World War I. So these soldiers at that time used to wear a brody helmet which did not protect the base of the brain. It was like a soup ball, shaped like a soup ball and was did not protect the base of the brain leading to bullet injuries of the occipital lobe. So other kind of defects can also be seen in striate visual cortex lesions. They can produce bilateral visual field constriction and a kind of keyhole deficit 
if the lesion is in the bilateral occipital lobe, sparing the occipital pole. They can also lead to bilateral altitudinal defects. If the lesion is midline and affects either both the upper banks or both the lower banks of the occipital cortex. If the lesion is limited to the inferior occipitotemporal region, then these patients may have associated contralateral color vision loss. So as you can see over here, if we just concentrate on this panel A, this is the inferior temp occipitotemporal region where we have area V4 and we know that this area is important for discrimination of colors. So if this area is affected unilaterally, so what will happen is that the contralateral, uh, there will be a contralateral color vision loss, that area will appear gray. So this is known as hemiachromatopsia. But in actual clinical practice, the lesion is a little bigger. So it will also involve the inferior bank of V1. So inferior bank of the calcarine sulcus. So this will be associated with the superior quadrantinopia. So the usual picture is to have a contralateral superior quadrantinopia and color vision loss in the inferior quadrant. So to summarize triad cortex lesions, uh, uh, unilateral defects may be missed historically. Visual field testing will give you highly congruous homonymous defects. Its anatomic layout is such that it can give rise to some characteristic visual field patterns like the quadrantic vision loss sharply respects the horizontal meridian. You may get macular sparing. There may be a peripheral temporal field sparing and there may even be a monoocular temporal field loss. The pupil examination remains normal and the fundus examination remains normal. So going on to the disorders of the extra striate cortex. So when we go on to disorders of extra striate cortex, we will mainly be dealing with disorders of visual recognition. So in, in these disorders, the elementary aspects of vision are preserved. But despite preserved elementary aspects of vision, there is a disorder of visual recognition. And this recognition disorder can be of six types. There may be a uh, recognition problem of the clinical deficit when we call it as the Anton syndrome. Problem in recognizing objects visually when we call it object agnosia. Word reading problem when we call it as alexia. Colors when we call it as achromatopsia or color agnosia. It may also involve faces when we call it as prosopagnosia. And the agnosia may be to simultaneous stimuli when we call it simultaneous agnosia, which is part of balance syndrome. So I'll be discussing all these one by one. So here comes a patient who has profound sudden bilateral vision loss due to bilateral occipital cardioembolic strokes, but the patient denies blindness. And if you ask the patient to tell you the details of the objects in front of him, he will say, I don't know how to tell. And he says, my vision is okay. So this is what we know, all know is the Anton's syndrome. So cortical blindness with lack of awareness of the deficit, lack of recognition of the deficit. And it's usually seen in acute bilateral occipital lesion. And the anosognosia part wanes over weeks to months and the patient becomes slowly, may become aware of the deficit. The pupil and the fundus examination remains normal and the precise neuroanatomic substrate, many uh, hypotheses are postulated. Some people say that because uh, the conscious perception of vision requires functioning of the V3 area, the conscious perception of vision takes place in V2, V3 area. So with an extensive lesion, these areas are affected. So there is no conscious perception of vision loss. Others also say that it is because there is a decreased interaction of these areas with the attentional networks or the frontoparietal networks, which are important for attention. On the other hand is a patient who has, who complains of severe visual impairment, but one is not able to find anything. So a woman, 23 year old woman, a young woman comes after hypoxic arrest with severely blurred vision, is not able to tell an object in front of her, not able to name it, but if you give her the object in hand, she is able to recognize it. And if we see the MRI, there are bilateral occipital cortical hyperintensities more in the border zone area. So this entity is visual agnosia, where there is impaired ability to recognize visually presented information, despite elementary aspects of vision being normal. The person cannot identify objects presented visually, but can do so through touch, through sound, through other modalities. So these patients have difficulty per processing the usual visual forms. So it is difficult to test their visual acuity with a standard eye chart. So the ophthalmologists usually get confused when 
these patients go for a uh, visual acuity examination so a better way, way to test the preserved visual acuity is a preferential looking test wherein you give two stimulus fields one is with stripes black and white stripes the other is a homogeneous gray area and the two have same average luminance so the location of these stripes is randomly alternated if the person can see the stripes we will prefer to look at them so the smallest stripe width which the person can locate gives you the resolution threshold or the visual acuity so visual agnosia is again of two types a perceptive and associative a perceptive visual agnosia refers to the one where the percept is abnormal the person is not able to generate a the basic contour of the visual object the brain the eyes are seeing but the brain is not generating the proper contour because it is not able to understand the geometric relationships and create a contour so because since the basic percept is not there if you ask the person to describe an object visually he will not be able to do so in addition to naming difficulty he won't be able to describe the appearance won't be able to copy it into a drawing and will not be able to match it to a similar object presented visually and these a perceptive agnosias are usually seen in bilateral occipital region lesions involving the area v2 and if it's unilateral it's usually the defect is on the right side on the other hand is an associative agnosia where the visual percept is normal but it has lost its meaning the meaning is no longer there so it is dissociated from its semantic knowledge so the patient, the person is able to make a percept so he can describe the appearance he can copy the object he can match the object to a similarly presented object but will not be able to name it will not be able to tell its use and will not be able to describe it will be able to describe it but not be able to name it or tell its use for example if a physician has to have an associative visual agnosia and you show that person a stethoscope he will if he has an associative agnosia the person will say that it's a long cord with something round at the end but not be able to tell that this is a stethoscope won't be able to tell what it is used for so pure associative object agnosia is usually seen in left sided lesions left occipito temporal lesions so if you see diagrammatically so our semantic system is integrating the information from all different modalities so from the visual modality after the percept is formed the information will go to the semantic hubs but if there is a disconnection the percept will be there the percept will be there but won't be able to associate it here is what we get the associative agnosia whereas if the percept itself the contour itself is not appreciated we will have the a perceptive agnosia so screening for this visual recognition disorders is usually done by showing the object to the patient in the visual modality and then cross checking it in other modalities and there are other some other objective ways like using masked words illusory figures overlapping figures or photographic portraits so if we see uh, if we if you want to see how to approach a patient who cannot name an object shown in the visual modality so there are four possibilities could be anomia could be visual agnosia could be optic aphasia which is uh, you know uh, difficulty naming limited to the visual modality could be loss of semantics so in anomia it's a language disorder cannot retrieve the names so you give the object in hand you give it in the visual modality the person will not be able to name but since the person can identify the object cannot just retrieve the name so he will be able to describe the use and will also be able to point to name the objects and define the object this is a visual agnosia where cannot name the object on visual presentation cannot describe its use cannot point to a name the object but if you give it uh, the patient in hand he will be able to touch and name the object in case of loss of semantics usually all the areas are affected and the person fails on factual questions about the object knowledge so another entity is prosopagnosia where we have difficulty recognizing faces so this young woman had difficulty distinguishing faces despite normal visual acuity visual fields and the brain mr showed a metastatic lesion in the right temporal area so this is a special form of visual agnosia where the perception of 
the unique features which distinguish an individual face from others is affected and the person uses other clues like gait mannerisms clothing voice to identify the uh, the person so the substrate for this kind of deficit is the fusiform face area which is in the inferior occipital temporal cortex and it has a right hemisphere specialization although the severe typical cases are usually seen after bilateral lesions so these experiments were done by canvisher in healthy individuals using functional mri then we have a uh, pure word blindness or alexia without agraphia where a person loses his or her ability to read to identify words but the rest of the language functions remain normal so this person will read extremely slowly letter by letter won't be able to read the word in a in one go and the special difficulty will be with irregular phonemic words and with handwritten material so this is a type of disconnection syndrome what happens is this is usually seen when there is a left occipital lesion extending into the splenium so because there is a left occipital lesion there will be a right homonymous hemianopia so whatever vision is left is in the left visual field the information from the left visual field will go to the right hemisphere from the right hemisphere it has to cross the splenium and reach the language area so here is the problem it cannot because the splenium is lesion it will lose its connection with the language areas and hence this reading difficulty rarely this alexia can also occur with discrete lesions in the visual word form area in the fusiform gyrus when the splenium is not involved so discrete lesions in the visual word form area and fusiform gyrus can also give rise to a similar kind of deficit but that is not that is less common then we come to disorders of color perception so uh, disorders of color perception just the way we have disorders of object perception we can club them in in a similar kind of fashion so one is central achromatopsia so central achromatopsia is loss of color recognition due to involvement of area v4 as i said area v4 was responsible for color discrimination in the lingual fusiform gyrus region so and this also has a non dominant specialization so the vision for these patients is bleached their eyes see but their brain does not perceive so they cannot read ishihara plates because they cannot discriminate between the colors they cannot sort the colors by hue it may be complete if the lesions are bilateral and in since it is affecting this area is lying in the inferior occipital temporal region if the inferior lip of the calcarine cortex is involved these uh, bilaterally there may be a bilateral superior altitudinal defect which is associated with complete this central achromatopsia in hemi achromatopsia uh, as i said uh, there is a contralateral lower field which is affected with superior quadrantinopia as i showed in the previous slide so this central achromatopsia is just like the a perceptive object agnosia the percept of the color is not there similar to associative object agnosia there is the entity of color agnosia where the person cannot name colors cannot point to named colors but can match colors can sort them and his semantics are also preserved so on one hand the percept is preserved can name the person can match the colors can sort the colors on the other hand the semantics are preserved he has his factual knowledge that the sky is blue but the connection between the percept and the semantics is lost so despite being able to see the color and match and sort the colors the person cannot name the color cannot point to the named colors because that knowledge of that color name is gone so this is also kind of disconnection then color anomia which is which may be part of a language disorder where the person cannot name colors but again like color agnosia can match colors can sort colors but will also be able to point to name if you give the name he will be able to point which he won't be able to do in color agnosia both these types of defects the patient can read ishihara plates because their color perception is normal so if we have to summarize this the difficulty in color vision may be peripheral may be central so in peripheral disorders the person may have a complete or partial cone deficiency or may have optic nerve disorders these peripheral disorders the color vision loss usually goes hand in hand with loss of visual acuity except for optic neuritis wherein the color desaturation may be disproportionate to the loss of visual acuity early on in the disease then these these patients are not able to read ishihara plates on the other hand in central achromatopsia there are field defects these people perceive the world as gray they also cannot name colors sort colors so they cannot read ishihara plates 
but they have other higher visual disorders which are associated like prosopagnosia alexia in color agnosia the person can perceive colors sort colors match colors so they can read ishihara plates but they cannot name the color cannot point to a named color and their semantics are preserved in color anomia the person is again able to perceive colors sort colors match colors hence read the ishihara plates they cannot name the color but they can point to a named color because the their defect is in just retrieving the name and they also have preserved semantics in semantic dementias there is loss of concepts the person will not even know that the sky is blue simultaneous agnosia which will which will come to in the subsequent slide is another entity where the person is not able to read ishihara plates despite normal color vision because they cannot process simultaneous stimuli so the next entity is again simultaneous agnosia where you miss the forest for the trees so this old woman had difficulty reaching out for things like a fork or cup she would have difficulty reading word book although she could read single words and if you take her to a visually complex environment she gets confused so when this lady is asked to read this she has to see what is it she will say she can say c e but she is not able to see the s which is formed by this e and she had associated deficits like inaccurate reaching of the targets and ocular apraxia and on the mri there is a bilateral parietal posterior parietal atrophy so this is the balance syndrome with its three cardinal features optic ataxia ocular apraxia and simultaneous agnosia wherein despite normal elementary vision and ventral stream functions the patients cannot disengage their attention there is a fixation of uh, vision they cannot disengage their attention and shift it to different parts of a visual scene so this is usually seen in bilateral posterior parietal lesions and, and is one of the variant presentations of alzheimers presenting as posterior cortical atrophy so uh, the first figure uh, the first figure shows optic ataxia where there is impaired motor reaching under visual guidance so if the patient is asked to touch one's nose that movement will be accurate because that just requires proprioception does not require visual guidance so this is how we distinguish optic ataxia from cerebellar ataxia in that the movements on one's own body are normal in the midline we see the ocular apraxia or psychic paralysis of gaze where the person cannot direct the eyes to a visually presented target but can accurately direct the eyes to a reflexive stimulus like sound the third is the simultaneous agnosia where instead of perceiving the picture as a whole the person can just perceive some local items and cannot find hence the person is not able to find items in a cluttered environment if the person will go to the refrigerator to find something out the person will not be able to locate that bowl or that particular thing and while reading the text the person will get lost so how will this person read he will jump from one line to the fourth line may go back to the first line so these these things have been seen on doing eye tracking experiments so if if see this panel a this is what a normal person would see he would fixate on all areas in a visual scene a person who has simultaneous agnosia will have spasm of fixation and he will see only one or two aspects of the visual scene and will not be able to synthesize it into a whole so this as i said this is uh, uh, due to lesions of the posterior parietal cortex which integrates multimodal information so we go on to the summary slide so if we uh, uh, look at this slide again if we revise our information b1 is the primary visual cortex where which is responsible for the initial processing of the visual information it will tell you about the basic location of the object and its basic borders or basic contours so this is also known as the striate cortex and the lesions of the primary visual cortex give rise to visual field defects then we have two pathways the ventral pathway and the dorsal pathway the ventral pathway is for object recognition the dorsal pathway is for visual spatial information in the ventral pathway v2 first uh, is able first sense color and the depth of the object if v2 is involved so the basic uh, the the deficits which we see v2 v3 are a perceptive visual agnosia where the percept formation is not proper and we also uh, uh, if these areas are involved the patient may not be aware of his vision loss giving rise to anton syndrome and if this uh, then the information goes on to v4 where we have discrimination of colors so this discrimination of colors happens in v4 if this area is lesioned this is in the inferior 
temporo occipital region, the lingual uh, gyrus region. So it gives rise to uh, color vision defects. After that, we have the fusiform gyrus. So fusiform gyrus is on the inferior aspect of the brain. So here we have two important areas, the fusiform face area, uh, which when lesion gives rise to prosopagnosia and the visual word form area, which when lesion gives rise to pure alexia. So in the dorsal pathway, we have two important areas, the V5 or the mesial temporal area, which is responsible for judging motion of the objects. So if this area is, if this area is preserved, and V1 is damaged. So what we can get is the Riddick syndrome. So wherein the person will not be able to judge a static stimulus, but will be able to judge the uh, moving stimuli. So if you move the fingers, fingers while doing the confrontation testing, the person will be able to judge them. If the fingers are kept static, the person will not be able to judge them. Another dis testing disorder, which uh, I didn't mention, if there is a lesion in the uh, V5 or mesial temporal area, then the person may stop perceiving moving stimuli. That is known as akinetopsia. So these people will see the moving stimuli as stationary objects. So if they see a moving car, they will feel that the car is jumping from one place to the other. They will not be able to appreciate the motion. This disorder is very rare. Then uh, we have this um, uh, the V6 area and the posterior parietal cortex, which is important for synthesizing the visual spatial information and the lesions of this area bilaterally will lead to the balance syndrome, which has three important components, optic ataxia, wherein the person is not able to reach the object accurately, ocular apraxia, where saccadic eye movements towards the target, voluntary saccadic eye movements are impaired, and simultaneagnosia, where the person is not able to synthesize the visual information into a whole, and especially gets confused when the person goes in a cluttered environment. <coughs> and then we have <coughs> this, uh, these are subcortical connections which uh, are thought to be spared and may underlie the phenomenon of Ritter syndrome. And for the hem as far as the hemisphere dominance goes, for the words, the left hemisphere is dominant. For facial recognition, it is the right hemisphere which is dominant. Although typical cases of prosopagnosia occur after bilateral lesions. So uh, I would end with these uh, these Archambaldo's paintings. Uh, he was an Italian artist who made a series of paintings using these uh, fruits, depicting fruits and vegetables in a bowl. So if you see the panel A, you are able to uh, make out some fruits and vegetables lying in a bowl. If this bowl is inverted, one automatically starts seeing a face in it. So uh, so one, uh, one important information which is deciphered from these paintings is that recognition of faces uh, requires an appropriate orientation of the image. Another important and interesting phenomenon is that if this image is shown to patients who have object agnosia, if you show these two images, in panel A, they will not be able to recognize that there are vegetables and fruits. But in panel B, they will be able to recognize the face. So that is very interesting for this higher visual cortical disorders. Thank you.